Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Saraja in Minneapolis, and I have the pleasure of hosting uh, tonight's Imager and the Interventionalist webinar, uh, uh, sponsored by uh, Cardiovascular Innovations. Uh, I'll make my introductions uh, uh, of our uh, guest speaker shortly. First, uh, this is uh, part four of our series uh, featuring uh, who I think are, is the most important part of what we do, and that is the imager. Uh, cannot do uh, anything without these folks because obviously you can't treat what you can't see. And so we're going to talk a lot about that tonight and really give the spotlight to our, uh, our guest uh, uh, for tonight. Uh, <clears throat> this is a CME uh, information. Um, there is uh, an, an opportunity that if you'd like to earn uh, uh, category one credits, uh, this activity is a credit for that. Uh, it's good for uh, one year uh, from today. And you can see the learning objectives uh, as outlined there. This is how you would go and claim uh, the CME credit. Uh, you go to the, uh, at the end of this webinar, you can just go to the website and then just uh, uh, complete the evaluation and the request form. Tonight, uh, I had the distinct pleasure of uh, doing this uh, webinar with uh, my colleague, Dr. Richard Bay. Uh, Dr. Bay is the director of the ECHO Lab and also director of Interventional ECHO here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute at Abbott. Uh, and uh, we have our disclosures uh, as outlined uh, there. I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors uh, for the commercial support of this activity, Abbott, Boston Scientific, and Medtronic. Uh, as outlined here. And a final plug here, uh, next year, CVI 2023 will be in Austin, Texas at the JW Marriott. Uh, the dates are July 20th to 22nd. Uh, we are absolutely delighted uh, to be moving to Austin uh, for 2023. Uh, as and many of us know, it's an incredibly beautiful city. Uh, the hotel is very close to a lot of the live uh, activity that goes on there and uh, really hope to see you all there. Please remember that uh, there is plenty of opportunity uh, for travel grants and support for those of you who would uh, like such support to come to the meeting. So tonight's uh, uh, webinar will be recorded and archived, and uh, this uh, um, recording will be available, among others, uh, at our website, uh, www.cvinnovations.org. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop sharing this screen and then uh, uh, introduce you uh, more uh, to Dr. Richard Bay. Richard, welcome. Thanks so much, Paul. It's really an honor to be here with you tonight. Yeah, well, it's just it's just great. And as as I as I mentioned to you before, and as we've done in this series, uh, we really are here to feature people like you uh, because uh, you're the backbone of what we do. And I want to first start by hearing a little bit about your background. I want to know where you're from, how you grew up to be a doctor, and then we'll talk a little bit about your field. Tell us where you're from. Thanks, Paul. Well, you know, it's it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you over these years. And uh, so my, I, I started way out on the East Coast. So I was born in Maryland. I grew up uh, in Maryland and I went to college in D.C. and med school in Baltimore. And I thought I'd be an East Coaster for life. And Somehow I ended up in Rochester, Minnesota for residency uh, and uh, tried to get out, but uh, I've been in Minnesota ever since, you know, it's, uh, it's been a great journey. Um, did you, uh, did you, when you were growing up, did you know where Minnesota was or did you have to look it up on a map when you, uh, when you applied? The only time I, I heard about Minnesota was in the winter. They would always say, well, the coldest place in the country, you know, <laughs> International Falls or something like that. And uh, I'd be like, wow, who would live there? It's like so cold. <laughs> it, it was like, you know, basically like Alaska, the tundra, you know, it was. Uh, yeah. And then uh, in medical school, when I, I told people I was going to, to Mayo, they're like, Minnesota, are you crazy? <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it, it was. Um, I, I really didn't know that uh, I'd be in cardiology, but my first rotation in, in internal medicine was cardiology with Bob Fry, who's still seeing patients in his 90s. 
was the attending. And uh, right off the bat, I was like, I, I love this. I, this is what I want to do. So, yeah, Bob is uh, uh, 90. I think he's 91 now. Oh, he's just and still just working like as if he was half his age. It's just it's amazing how he sees patients and people love him. What an inspiration he is to so many of us. Oh, yeah, he was amazing. And, and it, it's it's a small world because my nurse practitioner uh, was Beth Hunt, who's now with us in the EP, but she was a nurse practitioner at Mayo. So it's a kind of a small world kind of comes full circle. So what was your, what was your inspiration for being a doctor? You know, my, uh, my parents both worked at NASA uh, out in Maryland, the Goddard Space Flight Center. And my dad, he was smart. He said, you know, you really should consider going into computers. And I would have uh, hit that Silicon Valley wave just at the right time. But I, I worked, I tried, I worked there a couple summers and it just really, uh, I think I'd be 500 pounds if I did that, uh, <laughs> just sitting behind the computer screen. And I didn't really take to coding very well. So I was like, well, I got to find something else. And, uh, you know, I think uh, like most of us, medicine really just hit, click, checks a lot of boxes. We want to help people. We want to, uh, you know, make a difference and uh, it's intellectually challenging. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, a lot of role models were physicians. And uh, I said, you know, that, that sounds like a worthwhile pursuit. I really love biology and, and uh, in, in college, I was a bio major. So just kind of fit a lot of natural in interests. It's amazing. So I, I was a bio major, major too. And uh, look, looking back, I'm glad we don't have to apply to medical school now because <laughs> bio majors are like so boring. <laughs> exactly. You got to have something unique or different. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just uh, it just seemed a natural course. And uh, fortunately, you know, it, it just worked out. Wow. So you, you did medical school on the East Coast and yeah. uh, you made the leap to come to the Midwest. What? What, what was it that kind of made you stay here in the Midwest? I know Mayo brought you here for training, but like what, what kind of kept you? Yeah, you know, I mean, what almost didn't keep me was the weather as with most <laughs> people. That first winter in Rochester was just brutal. And, uh, you know, back then there were, there were no streaming services. There was just the Blockbuster, you know. <laughs> you see all your fellow residents in Blockbuster on the weekend. You know? I went to that blockbuster a lot. <laughs> I did. And I figured out, I was like, you know, this is how people can write so many papers because there's nothing else to do in the winter. It's so cold. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, from that first rotation uh, in internal medicine, I really just loved it. And then as I got more exposure, you know, uh, echo was a natural draw for me because I, I kind of like the physics aspect of it. Uh, and, uh, so it's the physics, the imaging, and it takes a little bit of skill. It's not just um, yeah. you know, instant image and you, you got to work for it a little bit. And all the hemodynamics I thought were fascinating. Uh, niches, you know, invasive hemodynamics were a little too hard for me. <laughs> I, I thought the echo was a little easy. That's <laughs> funny because I find echo hemodynamics far harder. <laughs> Those indocyanin green uh, dye curves, I, I was just like, you know, counting the boxes under the curve. Was, <laughs> that, was, that was tough. I don't know. The, the green dye, we're just counting humps. It's not, it's not, <laughs> but you guys have all these, you know, transformational equations and such. I can't keep track of all these things. Yeah, you know, and uh, so I was, um, I ended up staying for fellowship and I, I did the clinician investigator pathway. So that yeah. had two years of research and uh, it, it actually really fit my interests. I did two years of basic ultrasound research. So mm -hmm. I was actually in the uh, uh, biomechanics uh, area of the graduate school and uh, you know, really learning the nuts and bolts of the basics of ultrasound, the RF signals, how you get an image. And it was an exciting time because it was like the very, we did some of the very early stuff with strain, contrast, and 3D was just beginning. I mean, it was really painful 3D back then, uh, but I, I thought, man, this is really cool stuff. And, you know, you get to use a lot of computers and- uh, uh, that's, that's 
<laughs> that's amazing. So I, I mean, we take 3D for granted now. So like, what, what, what year is that when you think 3D started to come around? So when I started the fellowship, it was uh, 97. Um, I did a five-year fellowship. Uh, and at that time, what we would do is we would take a series of two-dimensional images and have the computer try to make a 3D image out of that. But you had a lot of motion artifact, respiratory artifact, uh, yeah. and it took hours to generate one really horrible image. <laughs> uh, but you were so proud of that one image, you know, and uh, wow, how far we've come now with, you know, real-time 3D, it, it's, it's quite amazing. It's, yeah, it's, like just, it's just push button. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, that's, that's it must've been like creating a masterpiece or something like a masterpiece of art. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you put it in the computer, you wait for three hours, <laughs> come back and it looks like a piece of junk, but uh, you were proud of it. That's like, uh, you know, and then you would manually segment out. We would um, do uh, animal studies and uh, like tie off the LAD and we did some contrast. And so we'd separate uh -huh. out the perfused versus the non-perfused and kind of separate out the 3D parts of the LV. And, you know, oh. we thought that was really cool, uh, but it was- Were those so dogs or work. Were those dogs or pigs? What, what were they? Uh, pigs, yeah. Oh, wow. Did, did, did any of those pigs survive? Because they, they tend to be really sensitive. Yeah, no, no collaterals. So, uh, like humans, not really. <laughs> a lot of uh, VF in the uh, animal labs, but. Uh, so, do you have any of those old three D images? Because I think that'd be really cool to see. Yeah, I think some of my like first papers, uh, you know, it, um, with three D contrast, uh, I think are are somewhere in the archives. <laughs> There, Probably there really nothing to write home about compared to nowadays, but those those very early days, it was it was exciting because it was a new frontier. Print print only, I presume. Yeah, I don't know if uh, scanned and digitized really made it that that far back in time, but we'll see. oh jeez, wow. So tell me, so how yeah you know, now a lot of people do echo, but not a lot of people end up in intervention. So how how did you fall into this? Yeah, so. Um, I ended up uh, coming uh, to Minneapolis Heart in 2002, and uh, I kind of decided that I, I was going to give up the basic science research, uh, basic ultrasound research, and just try to be a good clinical doc. But obviously, I had a, a background in echo, and I really enjoyed it, and I did a, a lot of T cases as a fellow and intraoperative cases. So when I got here, uh, Wes Peterson, uh, you know, who's now retired, um, was just starting out with the, uh, what we would call structural procedures with mitra clip and very early TAVR. Uh, and, um, you know, in the beginning he would have just whoever the TE doc was in, uh, tried to do these mitra clip cases. And as you know, it's, it's not for everybody. And, and that, in those days we didn't have 3D, it was just 2D imaging with a sequoia and uh, it was a much different procedure. I mean, you were just hopeful to get the clip on, you know, and, and not really doing the fine maneuvering that we do now to optimize the result. Uh, and, and it quickly became apparent that there were certain TE docs that really kind of migrated towards that and some really didn't like it. You know, some yeah. didn't like the amount of time you spent in the cath lab, the amount of, you know, wearing the lead, some didn't have the personality, you know, you have to be, you have to be a little bit decisive. Um, yeah. You can't waffle too much. You can't, uh, you know, take 10 minutes to decide how bad the MR is. That's what, <laughs> and so, well, you know what I, I'm talking about, you know, so yeah, uh, it, it kind of migrated that, you know, I, I kind of ended up working with Wes a lot uh, in the early Everest days, the mitra clip, and then yeah. As new devices came on, you know, then uh, I, I was kind of more involved, the first choice to get involved with those. And that's kind of how just organically, you know, I, I was drawn into the interventional echo space. So it certainly takes a, a distinct personality then, because I mean, we're, we're as interventionists, we're at your mercy. So you, when you say direct, yes, you're directing us very directly. And when you can't say, well, just turn the catheter somewhere else or something. You have to be very explicit, right? Yeah, yeah. 
so that it is a certain personality and uh, you have to deal with uncertainty uh, a little bit better. Uh, some, you know, non-invasive guys are much more uh, meek and afraid to commit and, uh, you know, are, are, are don't like to speak up so much, you know. Yeah. Um, I got a little bit of maybe that interventionalist gene in me that, <laughs> you know, but, you know, it, it also is, yeah. it, it's a relationship, you know, if you find that you, you know, work through a lot of cases and struggle with the uh, interventionalists, you know, you kind of develop this rapport and yeah. trust and language uh, yeah. or lack of language, you know, just the intuitive uh, uh, reading each other's minds. And, and it, it, you know, that, that's what makes it fun. Well, we, we, you and I have been at this for 10 years together here in Minneapolis. We, we were fellows together, but we never did procedures together. But since we've been here, it's been just amazing. So I just want to go back for a moment. What do you remember when your first microclip case was? Oh, I don't remember the year, but I do remember that I think it was somewhere between six and eight hours. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and that's the way it was in the early days. We didn't know really anything. I mean, transeptals were foreign to us, you know, uh, some of the views. We didn't have X plane imaging, we didn't have 3D. We, uh, had to go, you know, transgastric of the mitral valve was like, you know, foreign to us. And uh, so it was really hard just to see where the clip was a lot of times. And uh, it was a struggle. Yeah. I remember uh, in the early teachings during the commercial launch that they were talking a lot about temperature management and, uh, and trying to stay out of the stomach because you introduce air, you, you, if you go in too many times. Nowadays, we don't even think about that too much. Yeah, I think that uh, people have pretty much caught on, you know, if, uh, especially when you're um, uh, at high power or doing a lot of color, 3D especially, you know, the, the probe tip heats up quite a bit. Yeah. And, you know, if you're doing uh, six hours of that, you know, you can kind of slow cook the distal esophagus a little bit, get some edema there, and then your images get worse and everyone gets more frustrated. But nowadays, I mean, uh, it's pretty unusual to have a mitroclip procedure go on that long, you know, where generally it's gotten so much quicker uh, that it becomes less of an issue. So what advice would you have for uh, a, an early career person or trainee who's looking at echo or interventional echo, what would you advise them to, to look for uh, in this field? Yeah, I think, you know, if you think you have the interest and, you know, the, the personality maybe to pursue interventional echo, I'd say just come in and as many cases as you can. I mean, you really learn a lot, even just by watching. Uh, and as you know, I mean, in our early days, we, we would come in on weekends. We did a case on uh, Christmas Eve once, you know, uh, and uh, so it's just, you know, taking advantage of all the opportunities. Uh, and it, it's really learning from others so that that really speeds up your learning curve because, you know, I learned the hard way. I, I had to learn from scratch when there weren't really protocols, you know, or, or teaching sessions. There were no MitraClip 101s, you know, when we started. Uh, yeah. And so, it's really uh, watching cases, um, I, I think would be really uh, the best thing. Then you can kind of get an idea of the pace of the procedure, the communication that you need and, and the type of images that you need to be able to obtain. It's not just, you know, we'll talk about that today, but it's not just getting the diagnostic images, it's getting an image that helps you yeah. get the catheter where you need to be and uh, yeah. you know, get the procedure done. I think a lot of it is decision driven, right? It's images that are decision driven images. And you're right, it's not just for diagnosis, they have to be decision points. Yes. And, and I'd encourage them also to learn about the devices, you know, I mean, learn how the, what the interventionalist has to do to steer the mitra clip, you know, what, are, what do all the knobs do? And that way, if you kind of understand that you can give a better, you know, uh, direction to your interventionalist, you can say, put some more M on instead of, oh, you're, you need to fix this. You're, you're not heading in the right direction. You know, so yeah. I think that's so right. I have a, I have a couple things I want to share okay. uh, and I want to get your reaction to these things. So let's see here. All right. Tell me about this. 
Oh my goodness. So we got all the uh, original, uh, we got uh, Said Farvar in there, Wes Peterson, you, me. So that was this the, uh, the first uh, ten died. That's right. This is uh, April 8, 2015. So, I mean, you and I have shared a number of milestones. So I pulled up a couple here just to kind of talk through. You remember doing this and how we felt after this? Yeah, it was uh, it was amazing. Uh, I think, uh, you know, to replace a mitral valve without astronomy. I mean, that was just that was just incredible. Yeah, yeah, we we, we celebrated there. Yeah, I don't think we'll ever look that young again, but that's that's another story. <laughs> so yeah, so there's that. And then I have this one. How about this? Oh wow. So uh, this must have been uh this is our first triluminate. Yep, that's right. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Oh yeah, that that's been another journey, you know, from our early cases when we had no direction, no idea what we're doing. Uh, and and what kind of anatomy we could tackle uh, to where it is now? It's just uh, it's been an incredible journey, and it, we've come so far. That that was uh, that was a great feeling, you know. Uh, it, it's just so fun to be on the the front end of uh, these new technologies. That's that's also what's been just you know made the job incredibly uh, fulfilling. Yeah, I have to admit. Look, and this is. This is proof that I can't do anything without you. So here it is. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's cheering you, uh, just like celebrating, just like this could not have been done without Dr. Bay. You want to see it again? Here we go. <laughs> Oh, that's so fun. Yeah, yeah. That's so, oh, the the I don't know what you did to get the second cheer, but that was, that was great. Okay, so there's I that. I don't remember that, that actually. <laughs> it's an incredible celebration. Uh, you know, the trial is now closed and cannot wait to see the results of that. But I got to ask you, okay, so then this is going to dovetail into what I think you're going to talk to us about, which is case imaging. What does this mean? <laughs> yeah, I got a little riff on that in, in, in my thing. But, uh, you know, I, in the early days, I mean, it was thought, oh, yeah, it's just the uh, same idea. We just different valve, clip two leaflets together and uh, should be a piece of cake. And uh, as we quickly learned, all of us, that the tricuspid valve is much more difficult to image than the mitral valve. And uh, it was pretty painful in the beginning, you know, trying to figure out what, how we can image some of these grasps and, uh, and leaflet insertion. So I, I felt like uh, uh, Mr. Sulu there <laughs> in agony. As uh, you can see on my echo machine, there's just snow on the screen uh, and I'm not getting good pictures. So uh, I'm feeling the pressure there. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's funny how we, you and I have this telepathic way of communicating and every now and then I just say, boy, it's a bit wintry out, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I take those clues and uh, <laughs> uh, I have a couple slides of our, our translations of our, uh, our, of our language here too. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, you want to take us through some of your slides here and we'll... Uh, We'll talk through your cases. We'll, we'll do a back and forth as we go through. Sure. So mm -hmm. I thought that, um, you know, instead of uh, really a didactic lecture, I could go through some cases and, and just highlighting the point uh, where with interventional echo that it's not, it's going beyond the standard diagnostic views because during a procedure, oftentimes that's not going to cut it and that's not going to get you where you need to be. So my title is Creative Imaging When Standard Views Don't Cut It. Um, and here's, here's my, my disclosure slide. Yeah, all right. So uh, <laughs> yeah, this is the updated uh, version. So uh, sometimes during a case, you'll hear Paul, Paul say, Richard, I'm just going to stop here and wait for you. And <laughs> what I hear is, your imaging sucks. I can't do anything until you give me something I can work with. Jeez, hurry up. Time's a waste. <laughs> I'm just in agony because I'm like, okay, I, I need to get him a better image. And uh, how can I do that? So 
Uh, oftentimes, you know, especially in the early with a new device and there's no protocol and we're just figuring out what's what we're doing. Uh, you know, I do feel a lot of stress and, uh, and pressure <laughs> because I, I want to get the best images possible to to get the job done. So, you know, you know, Richard, I, I don't do this to you. Come on. This is <laughs> this is. Yeah, <laughs> no, that, that this is the translation is my imagination. You know, I know that you're. You, you have no malintent when you say that. You're just like, you know, you're being nice. You're giving me a little bit of time. So don't, you know, don't well, worry. Well, it's, it's, you know, as, as we're partners in this, you know, one of us has, if, if we're struggling with something, one of us has to sit still because otherwise it's like two people moving, you know, targets. It becomes, you know, quite hard. And so, so that's usually, that's usually where it comes from. I'm just saying, okay, one of us has to sit still so the other one can like work on it. So I, I just, I'll usually up and volunteer, but yeah, you're right. It does mean that we're stuck. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, 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 I take it harder than it, it's intended just because uh, <laughs> you know, I want to, I want to do the best I can. So no, I'm not saying that that's what you're actually meaning, but that's what I hear in my mind. Cause it's like, well, maybe I mean it sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. And, and you bring a good point, you know, I mean, either I have to come to you and find you or you need to come to my image. Uh, and, but if we're both moving at the same time, it just doesn't work. You know? so, um, so basically, you know, the point is there's a difference between just imaging for diagnosis and imaging that facil facilitates navigational guidance and device deployment. So I thought we'd go through some cases just kind of highlighting where, where this comes into play. So we've done all these cases together. So uh, you may remember them a little different than me, but uh, you know, uh, this is a closure of an LVOT to RA shunt. I don't know if you remember this case. Thank so, you. you know, we get into the lab, and uh, the plan is to plug this. So you can see on the upper left the short axis view. You can see the shunt uh, from the LVOT into the RA very nicely, and in the long axis you can see it as well. And you know, Doppler confirms that it's a systemic to, you know, right-sided shunt. Um, but, you know, visualizing that and getting a wire across is a different thing. You know, uh, you, you are having some difficulty trying to get it from the RA side. And then from the LVOT, finding the defect was a little bit difficult and those standard views weren't really helping much. So instead of just sitting there, you know, waiting for you to, you know, find the mirac miraculous uh, little hole, uh, I thought, you know, let's look around, see if I can be a little bit more helpful. And uh, we found this this view. I don't know if you remember this. So this oh, is a transgastric yeah. view. Yeah. And uh, this was just beautiful because you could see the defect and you can see like this windsock uh, yes. shaped tissue and, you know, it closes uh, the door and that's why you can't get from the RA side. Uh, but uh, you really nicely have a, a path from the aorta down into that defect uh, in this view. Yes, I remember this now because I was like, it was one of those aha moments because, uh, you know, until you actually see what's really going on, you think there's a hole there. You should just be able to pass a wire through. But here it is beautiful that that windsock was just is so telling. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's uh it's just trying to be helpful and, and you know sometimes you get lucky and you find something like this and it just really makes a big difference because you know floor is not really helping you uh, find this uh, and then once we had this view you know kind of help uh, guide where where to direct uh, a wire to get it across and then we see it in the other uh, short axis view that the wires into the RA and then you snare it and then bring a catheter the other way back across into the LVOT and out the aortic valve. I love I love how you're showing only echo images. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, uh, here's the uh, distal disc uh, coming back, and we can see that it's not impinging the aortic valve uh, leaflet motion. And then the uh, proximal disc, and uh, we see that each disc is on the right side. And then we go back to that other view. And it is, it's just a really nice view. You can see that uh, it's not causing any aortic regurgitation and it's not impinging on that septal leaflet insertion. So I think, you know, this is an instance where finding that one view really made a big difference in the case. Was it a VSD device that we put in? What was it? 
I, can't I think remember. it was a small VSD device. I think it was a small VSD, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just beautiful. Wow. So, so how many hours did we spend doing this case? Excuse me? How many hours did we spend doing this case before you found that view? Uh, you know, I, I, I felt bad because I, I think, you know, I was watching you try to get a wire across for, it, it must have been, it wasn't that long, maybe 20 minutes, you know, and then I, I get the clue that uh, I need to be a little more helpful, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was long enough, you know, the thing about us when, when you do this long enough, you realize that within, within a short period of time that it's not going to be straightforward. Exactly. You know, and, the, and that you're just going to have to do something else. And I think actually for less experienced folks, that's a key learning thing that just comes with experience is that you just reach a certain point where you just realize you, you just have to try something and it, it becomes obvious to you. And uh, you could tell at that point, based on how much we've worked together, that whatever I was doing, whatever Paul was doing, it's not going to cut it. And so we're going to need additional help. So it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, it's. Um... It's just, you know, if one view isn't working, you can stay on that same view for an hour and it's still not going to work, you know, so try yeah. something different. How else can I see this area, you know, and yeah. you know, it's just like, well, you know, we, we, we use this view, uh, view somewhat for Taver, you know, and so it, it just happened to work. So, you know, if, if something's not working, you, you got to look for alternatives. Yeah. Wow. So that was a nice case. Uh, this is another one uh, with a plug, this uh, patient that had an a ascending aortic graft and then developed an, an a, a pseudoaneurysm just at the distal anastomosis. I don't know if you remember this one. So, um, you know, here you can see uh, the pseudoaneurysm on CT very nicely at the distal anastomosis of the graft. You can see contrast going into it and was not felt to be a great uh, surgical redo. So I uh, felt reasonable that, well, let's try to put a plug in it. And uh, I love it because, you know, Paul just says, yeah, we'll give it a try. We'll, we'll, we'll try anything. So, <laughs> um, but then we get in and I, I get our standard views and, you know, don't really see anything from uh, the mid esophageal view. So then we go into a little the ascending aorta view and I get a short axis and I'm able to see the pseudoaneurysm in the ascending aorta and short axis, but I can't see the defect. So, uh, you know, I, I, I just say, I don't think I'm going to be much help, uh, but maybe, you know, fluoro will be more helpful in this case. So Richard, so, is this a pseudoaneurysm there? Was that, was that in that, is this a pseudoaneurysm in front of us? Uh, so this is the pseudoaneurysm here. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So this is the ascending aortic graft. You can see the graft. It's not really circular. And then there's the pseudoaneurysm. I see. So, so you're I, having I, trouble seeing the communication. Yeah, I don't see the communication because it's at the distal end. And that, that that's an area we don't, we can only see so high in the ascending aorta by TE usually. Yeah. So um, this, uh, I said, I, I don't think I'm going to be much help. And then you did a aortic root injection and you can see that puff. Uh, going into the pseudoaneurysm up there, mm -hmm. kind of where the TE probe is. So, th uh, you know, the thought was try to get it in uh, based on the fluoro. And uh, so you're getting the wire in that region, and I pull the probe back almost till it's out of the esophagus, you know, it's right, almost being extubated. Uh, <laughs> but so you could see it on, on fluoro, but, you know, again, uh, seemed to be quite challenging to, to find that specific hole, uh, you know, uh, on fluoro. So again, after a little period of struggle, I, I kind of get the ESP that, you know, maybe I can be a little bit more helpful here. Uh, and, you know, from that distal position where it's almost out of the esophagus, I start playing around uh, and, and the probe is at borderline extubation. Uh, <laughs> And lo and behold, I find this tiny little window where you can see the communication uh, into the wow. pseudoaneurysm. So this is the uh, ascending aorta, uh, the distal end of the graft, and we see the communication into the pseudoaneurysm. So, so the, uh, the far field is ascending and the bottom uh, uh, near field is descending. Is that right? Or uh, So yeah, the aortic valve would be down here. Yeah, okay. so we're, we're, we're up at the distal ascending okay. aorta and the arch would be right there. Yeah. So the, so the arch is kind of going away from us a little bit? 
uh the arch would be kind of yeah going uh just just uh, after this point would be the nice. beginning of the arch okay and then so uh once you know we kind of locate this we can x plane off of it and here you see the ascending uh, aortic graft right there and right at the distal end is the mouth of the into the pseudo aneurysm here so we see that communication here and then it turns out that this view was helpful because uh, you know we found this where you could actually put your catheter there and actually just aim for that hole. Yeah. Uh, and so you know it, it ended up being a really useful view because it kind of showed you where to go. Uh, yeah. And then you were able to just uh, shoot a wire across in there, and then on the floor we see it looped around in the pseudo aneurysm, and then uh, you put a catheter in. Um, and then injected some contrast is what it looks like on echo. You can see it's pretty free flowing in that pseudo aneurysm. Uh, and here it is on uh, fluoro. You see it's a big pseudo aneurysm there. It's amazing how these things don't just rupture when not with all this manipulation that we do. In exactly. Uh, uh, and uh, and it, here's where you put the plug in. And the, the fascinating <laughs> thing was as soon as you deployed this plug, yeah, all of this free flowing uh, stuff just became immediately uh, there was stasis there. And so that was a very good sign that, you know, uh, the flow was uh, disrupted in there into the pseudo aneurysm. That's amazing. So that is that another, I think that's just an ADP2, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, and I, I'm going to guess, looks like maybe like a 10 millimeter device, it looks based on your number, your markers there. But that's yeah, it might have even been a eight, but it, yeah. yeah, it was uh, it was not a huge uh, hole. Yeah, um, it must have just been where a suture kind of tore through um, at the distal anastomosis. Uh, but uh, you know, it ended up being that this view really became very helpful and helped uh, to facilitate the Beautiful. case. The uh, you know, so for the sizing, so if anybody wants to know, the um, usually I take whatever Richard says and I double it just because of the, uh, we want to oversize, first of all, and then uh, on echo, you know, I think just, just to make sure everything fits, I usually just take twice of what you tell me. And so I, I don't remember what we thought, what it, what it was on the 2D image, but uh, usually twice is what I, what I go for. Yeah, and this is just the orthogonal view. You can see the, uh, the graft and it's right at the end of the graft where that uh, the hole was and, and here's the plug, so. It was, it was really nice, uh, nice case. You know, I don't. I, I know we've done a number of these, but I I don't remember following up on this one to find out what what happened to the patient afterwards. I I, I do I, remember there was a a follow up CT uh, that showed that there was no contrast extravasation. So uh, uh, and the pseudoaneurysm was smaller, but uh, I I don't know clinically otherwise. But uh, it, I I think they did well. It looks like the, the patient had other pseudoaneurysms because I noticed on the fluoro there are some coils. Yes. Apex and maybe a plug. Is that? Yeah. Is that so I think that there was a, uh, I think during the surgery they had a vent in and uh, they oh. developed an apical pseudoaneurysm and then you guys coiled that. Yeah. And after that, then they discovered this other pseudoaneurysm. That's right. That's right. I remember this now. That's right. He was like multiple pseudoaneurysms in one patient. Yes, yeah. it's really not healthy tissue all around. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that that was pretty cool. Um, this was an older one. This was the LV apical pseudoaneurysm. So similar oh, to what this lady yes. had. I think um, I remember this one. Yeah, after transapical TAVR previously, and uh, so again, it was felt that uh, it was worth a percutaneous approach, but you know, patient gets in on the table and this is what I see on TE. You can see the pseudo aneurysm, but I don't think TE imaging is gonna be very helpful. Uh, we tried transgastric, it really didn't help. And so, you know- I mean, I, this I, image looks like it was from a machine from decades ago. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is where we get really get, you know, snarky and say it, it's a bit wintry here in Minnesota. Yeah, a lot of snow. So, you know, I, I could just, you know, just say, well, I'm not going to be of much help, but, you know, the, the point here is that don't forget, you know, not everything is TE driven and you have another probe on the machine all the time, and that's the transthoracic uh, probe. So, 
that's what we tried here. And, and lo and behold, I mean, it's it's a little bit off axis, but you can see the pseudo aneurysm, you can see the neck, uh, and you can see the flow by color in, in and out of the uh, LV. So, um, you know, this is a, a much better image for guidance in the sense that uh, we can see the neck. And then from this, you guys uh, access the pseudo aneurysm through the chest wall uh, with yeah. the needle and then got a wire across that neck. And then first the wire want to go into the uh, across the mitral and then reposition it across the taver uh, yeah. and then stared it and then brought a catheter in the reverse way and yeah. put it at the mouth and injecting a little contrast demonstrating that it's in the right spot. Um, and then so this uh, is, uh, we went through the chest, right? Yeah, through the chest yeah. wall right into the pseudo aneurysm. Yeah, and then uh, and then out the aorta. Yeah, it that way, right? Scary. Yeah, yeah. Because what I was concerned about was I, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get around the mitral valve and the cords if I went retro. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it it went pretty slick. You were able to get that, and then here's the distal disc, and then the yeah. proximal disc, and then uh, here it is closed, and that at least by color flow the uh, yeah. Uh, the shunt's better. And, and then back to TE, you know, you can see it, but, you know, you can see that that TE is not going to be much help with navigation. So and the point is that, you know, use whatever you have in your toolbox to get the job done. And it's not always TE. Sometimes the transthoracic probe um, can be helpful. Wow. So, you know, you want to keep up your transthoracic uh, imaging skills. Uh, you know, a lot of times the fellows don't want to do transthoracic imaging, but if you're interested in structural, you should, you know, try to be facile with the transthoracic probe too, because you never know when you're going to need it. It's amazing in that bottom image on the TE, and now that you know what you're looking at, you can definitely see it there. Yeah. yeah. But, but beforehand, it, that would have been really hard to see. Yeah, you have all the shadowing coming down in and out, and it's in the far field, and uh, yeah. The transthoracic images weren't beautiful, but they were good enough, and, and that's what you need. Wow. So, um, I know you remember this one. This is a mitra clip with an ASD occluder. Yeah, this one was a bit nauseating. <laughs> so, this was a patient that originally had uh, MR, and uh, we got a pretty good result with one clip. Uh, the problem was that uh, the clip yeah. got caught on the septum because the handle wasn't pulled back, and uh, this was a bear to get get back across. I don't know if you wanted to make a comment about that. Yeah, no, I think uh, we were playing on a second clip, right? Yeah, is that what it was? I think, I think so. Yeah. And then we're gonna do another one. I can't. And then and then yeah, the the DC handle wasn't pulled back far enough, and I was I wasn't paying attention, and I was trying to straddle the device and before I knew it. I put the clip far ahead of the uh, the guide, and the guide ended up on the wrong side, and uh, and as a result, um, um, we got stuck. And uh, and yeah, here you see pushing and pulling on this you know, side. Uh, I didn't want to call a surgeon, and uh, and sure sure enough, pushing and pulling eventually got us free. But that yeah, that's a beautiful image of a really a, a rich emotional experience. <laughs> Yeah, none of us were feeling great at this point. And this is the result, you know, uh, kind of had a little tear of tissue there. You can see a little flap and a little bit of bi-directional shunt. So uh, the mitral re regurgitation was reduced, you know, pretty well. Uh, and so at the end of the case, you know, uh, uh, the ASD was closed. Um, yeah, it was really, you can see how uh, oval it was. The disc really did not sit uh, well against the, the defect because it's, it's essentially a big slit yeah. and uh, it's what I've often described as hamburgered uh, <laughs> because of the uh, uh, the way they the waist is really pinched together so so the patient did well for a while and then uh, but a year later came back with uh, symptomatic MR and you can see there's regurg on both sides of the previous clip uh, and so the thought was, well, maybe we can go around the uh, ASD device and uh, put some more clips in. Uh, and then the uh, problem is, you know, it's, it's hard to see the needle. Uh, and uh, fluoroscopically, you have landmarks there. You see the uh, 
uh, ASD occluder device. So you kind of know where you'd want to go across. And uh, if, Paul, you put the needle there and you say, I think this is the, the perfect spot. Can you see me? Should I cross? And uh, so this is, a, <laughs> just an, uh, this is a joke again, you know, it's like, uh, I'm on the septum, show me where I am, can I cross? And I, I say, I don't see you. And then the <laughs> translation is, I don't see you because you're not on the septum. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, that only goes so far. It's like, well, what do we do now? And the, the learning point here is that, well, I got this 3D view of the atrial septum from the LA side. And you can see uh, this, this one really explains what's going on. You have this ASD uh, occluder device and it's going all the way to the edge of the uh, um, posterior LA free wall here. And this is kind of where this hash mark is, is kind of where your needle was. And if we had punctured through there, we'd probably be in the pericardial space because this just yeah. takes up so much space. So that answered that question, but then it's like, well, what do we do if we go underneath, we're not gonna have enough height or if we go up, here, we're going to have too much height, or if we go over here, we're going to be way too anterior. Uh, and yeah, so we basically realized that the, uh, the, where the, the center of the ASD device is the perfect spot, and that's why it's there. <laughs> so right. we needed to right. go close to it. Yeah. So I think, you know, the question was, well, what do we do now? And I, I think uh, one of us facetiously said, well, why don't we just go through it? And uh, I didn't think, uh, uh, that was a serious thing, but it, it ended up happening. So uh, you know, you, uh, there was some interesting uh, electrocautery effects with the Bayless yeah. people going through that, but uh, we're, we're able to get through. And then you can see on that bottom right, um, kind of cross near the center where ideal would be. Uh, and it took some finagling, but we got another couple of clips in. Uh, and then there was that hole through the ASD occluder device, which I think subsequently ended up putting a plug in, but yeah we're able to get the job done so yeah that was really hard that was uh um the the aso device really just it took a number of non-compliant balloons and just the guy just would not go across and eventually i can't remember if i think it was a 16 millimeter nc uh, peripheral balloon that eventually did it and then the guy went across and then and then we thought well we got to do as much as we can. Uh, so you can see, we put it, in, I think an additional two clips was yes. better, right? Medial yeah. and lateral to the first one. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, and then he, and then he came back later with that, that residual shunt saying, uh, you know, that he wasn't doing well, wanted that close. And uh, we just put a little plug across that. So it was kind of, it was really interesting that we, I mean, look, you look at that hole there. I mean, it was, it was, it was huge. And, and then we had to plug it afterwards. So, yeah. And, and, and the, you know, from the echo standpoint, it's that, you know, 3d view of the LA showing where that uh, ASD occluder device was that, that helped prevent a disaster. So, you know, it's not just guidance. It's also figuring out when things aren't, don't quite fit to avoid disaster, getting the right views. So. Now, how is he, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you show, using the ASO device where not to go, you know, if we didn't have the ASO device, I mean, how would we know not, not to go to that posterior? Because that, that's really hard to see back there. Yeah, I think, you know, in this, uh, this uh, short axis, uh, without the device there, I mean, yeah, we would have been able to see it a little bit better, I think. Okay. But here you can see that Watterson groove there, right yeah. there. You know, that, that's the danger triangle. You don't want to go through that triangle because uh, that's when bad things can happen. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> and then uh, this is not a specific case, but this is a view, you know, that we, through our tricuspid journey, this transgastric off-axis uh, view. So this is just, you know, sometimes just riffing and, and finding something that's you know, not been necessarily described before uh, to help uh, during the procedure. Um, you know, we, we all love it when we get these beautiful tricuspid uh, uh, clip uh, grasping views where it's just like mitral and you can see everything and a uh, piece of cake, but uh, unfortunately that's often not the case. Uh, and so uh, we, we struggle with uh, imaging uh, the grasp and uh, insertion a lot, sometimes from the uh, esophageal window, the 
shadowing and, and various things. Uh, and so we oftentimes rely on this transgastric view. And, you know, I, as we did more and more cases, I've noticed that sometimes I get this view, it's kind of a, a short axis view, uh, more posteriorly, but here anteriorly, you see it kind of opens up to see more of that uh, RA and you can see the anterior leaflet and the septal leaflet. And it's kind of like in between a short axis and a four chamber view. And you can see the uh, ends of the clip arms here and, and the leaflet kind of going over the ends. And so this gives you, you know, additional uh, confidence about leaflet insertion in your grasp. And so, you know, playing so off this, this is, this is the, so I'm saying it publicly because you've heard me say it privately so many times. This is the bay view. And I, I love this bay view. It's, it's not really the, the deep gastric where things are like a transthoracic. It's somewhere in between. Yeah. And it, it, it's just, this is just, it's beautiful. It gives you a lot of confidence in the insertion. Yeah, and, and you know, when your, your esophageal windows are, are tough, you know, I mean, I think this really uh, gives all of us a, a lot of confidence that we have a good grasp. And then, you know, just playing off of this, sometimes you can rotate it even more so that it's all, you know, almost completely yeah. upside down. And you can see the arms coming at an angle, you can see the grippers underneath, and you can see the leaflets coming in and watch as it closes. So this is, uh, you know, often if you can get this, this is a, a really uh, great to confirm leaflet insertion and, and a good grasp. Um, I mean, this gets really close to being like a T uh, transthoracic probe. Exactly, yeah, it's, it's like a, a beautiful. Right? Yeah, and here's just another example, you know, it, it's not a true, you know, four chamber view, but you know, it's upside down like a transthoracic and, uh, you know, here you can see the leaflets just coming in over the arms and, and you see this yeah. and you can see the shaft coming into the clip here too. Yeah. Um, it, and it, it says, if you can get this, you know, then, you know, that you're, you're uh, pretty much done in terms of leaflet insertion. So that's what I, I mean, that's what's, I mean, that's just so helpful because, you know, we, we struggle with these cases where, you know, the leaflets are really thin they're varying in their quadcation planes and they can be finger-like and, and such. And sometimes we, you know, when I try to grasp a leaflet, sometimes I feel like I'm grasping at straws. Uh, and, you know, and so this insertion, this confirmation, is just so important. And we, you and I have been in multiple cases where we just hunt around and then I just, this is okay. This is where I stop and say, um, okay, I'm going to wait for you. <laughs> yeah exactly it's, it's not it's not it's not it's not it's it's because i know that if we if i wait you you and give you time you you you'll, you'll find the view you know and there's there's no sense in doing anything other than just waiting and looking and uh and it, it comes up like this and it's like oh it's a it's an amazing aha moment that we have <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, you know, if you can get this, then it's like, okay, I feel a lot better uh, about this clip we can uh, release. And, and, you know, we joke a lot that, and I'm not an NPR denier, so I want to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think, you know, Paul, and I, you, know, you and I have done so many of these cases in the pre-NPR era that we've kind of compensated for a lot of things and, and for our workflow a lot of times. Uh, you know, I just put it at a different level in our workflow, but this just shows that, you know, I, I do, I, I, I do know what it is and, uh, you know, it can be helpful <laughs> here in the bottom left, you know, you can kind of get that upside down view uh, and you, you yeah. kind of see leaflet insertion. So if you have really good uh, transgastric views, this can be really helpful. Uh, or if you have really good uh, esophageal windows, you know, this can be really helpful. And just to prove that it wasn't only just once, you know, <laughs> that we did where, you know, it ended up being being very helpful for leaflet in, insertion. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and, and as you discuss, you know, uh, it's similar view to this transthoracic, which we have on occasion resorted to. You know, if I'm reaching for the transthoracic probe, things aren't, <laughs> it's not. Yeah. Okay. As soon as I hear that, that, that the click of the T probe into the stand, and you start to reach for the transthoracic, it's kind of like, okay, all right, I'm waiting for you now. <laughs> yeah, no, and hopefully, you know, ice will uh, really kind of obviate the need for that, but uh, that 
remains to be seen. But it, you know, don't forget, it can be helpful in a pinch. I mean, especially if you get, you know, they have good windows like this. I mean, yeah. why not? It's, it's, it's not a bad view. Um, Absolutely, yeah. But some of the challenges there, Richard, don't you think, I mean, it's just that, you know, you, you, you want to make sure you're grabbing the right pair. Yes. And, and sometimes it's just, at least for the interventionalists especially, it's hard to interpret which pair you're grabbing. Right, from the transthoracic, you don't, you don't know what, whether you're on the anterior leaflet or posterior leaflet. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, a situation where NPR, you know, can be helpful. If you have some trajectory questions or trajectory issues, yeah. uh, you know, you can kind of see multiple planes at once. You kind of compensate for this because you watch, uh, you know, the septal lateral uh, from the short axis X plane as we're going in. And then yeah. you look for anterior posterior trajectory as you're, as we're in the stomach and you watch the clip coming back, whether it's migrating anterior or posterior. So you kind of compensate for that uh, kind of on, uh, on your own, but uh, you know, NPR can be helpful in those situations. You know, if, if you're a site that has had uh, uh, frequent issues with GI trauma from the transgastric going in and yeah. out, you know, the, the NPR can be helpful to avoid going in and out. If you have poor transgastric views or good transgastric views and poor esophageal windows, but, you know, it comes down to what you're used to and which is going to take longer. Is it going to take longer to set up the NPR and, and or just kind of find a good 2D window, you know, and oftentimes yeah. we find that, it, you know, we, we can get a 2D window uh, without, you know, um, it, it takes me a few minutes to set up the NPR. So sometimes yeah. the 2D is faster. Uh, but, you know, I think it, it's it every site will find it in a different level in their algorithm. Um, yeah. And uh but it's, I'm not a denier. It's a, it's a good tool. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like, I'm, like, I'm sure that people before 3D uh, were, would look at 3D now and just kind of say, well, I can just do it with 2D. I don't need 3D. And, you know, it's kind of like, well, there are people now who look at NPR and say, well, we can just do 2D and, and, and some 3D. And so it's, 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 it's exactly that. It's what you're comfortable with uh, and what gets the job done. And I think all of these, all of these new modalities, they have incredible roles and, and support what we do. I think, you know, the, you lose a little resolution with the NPR. I think that'll only get better. Um, yeah. And another thing is sometimes, you know, as we get older, we like bigger images, so, you know, with like the 2D, I can, I can zoom it really big. <laughs> <laughs> right. Instead of looking at the small window, it's like, oh, I kind of, kind of see it. But yeah, no, there's, I, I don't know if there's anything more satisfying than when you give me a 2D and it's zoomed and I see the leaflets deep inside the arms and it's like, it's kind of like you're sprinting towards home base. You, you're like, I, I know I'm about to be done. This is, this is such a good feeling. Yeah. And so you're right. I, I love that mag up zoom image. Um, and so this last case is just kind of a freebie. This is a, a coronary sinus to LA shunt device. Uh, so we've done uh, several of these. Uh, it's for HEPPEP. It's a, a, a device that creates a shunt between the coronary sinus and left atrium to unload uh, LA pressure. Um, and really, this is a floral guided procedure based off CT analysis. And uh, my first case, they said, well, the echo is really there, just monitor for complications and confirm a shunt at the end. But, you know, if I'm going to sit there uh, through the case, I might as well, you know, I, we're never, that's never an object that we learn to image the coronary sinus, uh, you know, on routine echoes. So I don't know, what can I see? You know, might as well give it a shot. And so it, it turns out you can often see quite a bit, you know, you can crop and uh, here you can see the kind of the coronary sinus cut in half uh, entering in from the right atrium. Uh, here you can see the wire coming down from the SVC into the coronary sinus, um, the marker catheter going in, and then uh, the needle puncture into the LA. Uh, we can visualize that on TE and then the safari wire wrapping around into there. Uh, and then here on the bottom, you can see the balloon inflation uh, enlarging the hole. Uh, and then after the device is deployed, you can see the LA side of the device with the two arms here. You can show that there's flow uh, in through there. And, you know, you can actually, um, here, it's just a zoomed up view. Uh, 
uh, showing the same thing, the device with the flow through it. And you can flip it up on its side and here you see the LA arms up top and the coronary sinus arms, you know, with the tissue in between nice. on the bottom with the flow in between. So, you know, I mean, if you're looking at a device in an in a anatomic area that, you know, you, you're not used to imaging and, and you have time, you know, might as well try to see what you can see. It might be helpful in the future. And so it's just kind of cool to, to show that you can actually see quite a bit uh, by yeah. echo. It almost looks like a Martian landscape. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can certainly do Doppler and, and measure a gradient across. Uh, so the LA to coronary sinus gradient was peak of eight. So it's, uh, it, you know, uh, this was just a freebie, you know, might as well see what you can try to see. <laughs> But, uh, you know, in summary, you know, through these cases, you know, as an interventional echocardiography, you know, certainly you need to understand the anatomy and the procedural steps involved in, uh, in the case. Uh, and you need to be able to find the best views to facilitate navigational guidance. And that's not always the standard views. And you want to be able to visualize things if things aren't going right to avoid uh, complications. And it's a little bit of an art to kind of get that sense of when standard views won't cut it and when you need to reach in your toolbox for alternatives, you know, off-axis views, transgastric views, 3D, NPR, TTE, or even ICE, which we didn't really talk about. But, you know, I mean, you, you have a, a bunch of tools in your toolbox and it's for just finding the right one uh, for the job uh, in the right situation. Uh, and that's where the art comes. But, you know, it's been a uh, fantastic journey with you, Paul. I really appreciate you allowing me to uh, join you on this journey. And uh, we've had a lot of fun. And uh, I think it, it's always exciting to be on the, the cutting edge and, uh, and kind of uh, finding new frontiers. So oh, I mean, those, those, are, those are great examples of our partnership, Richard. And uh, I just, uh, I am so privileged to work with you uh, and our team. Um, it, it's been amazing. If people are going to think that pseudorandoms are in the water here, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, we've done a lot of those. And they're, it, it, it's, I mean, what I'm always impressed by, Richard, is your knowledge of what I do. You know, I mean, try this, Paul. Try that. You know, uh, put this in, you know. And you, you, you have an incredible knowledge. And I think that that helps a lot on our communication or <laughs> the lack of need to communicate because we just know what each other's doing. <laughs> so, yeah. But, <clears throat> and I, I joke a little bit uh, and, uh, you know, but I couldn't have asked for, you know, a better partner through this. I mean, Paul, you're, you're very patient and understanding, you know, I, I put more pressure on myself than you, you put on me. Uh, <laughs> and and the, so those translations were a little bit of a joke, but uh you know, I mean, I, I, like I said, I couldn't have asked for a, a, a better partner in this journey. And it's been, it's been fantastic. And I, I look forward to, you know, what the future brings. Oh, well, thank you, Richard. It's very gracious of you and it's mutual. Uh, but we're not retiring. We're not going anywhere, anywhere no. yet. We got a lot of years left. So, so, so stick around. <laughs> so, but with that, you know, uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll close it because we're at the top of the hour. And I, as always, I always learn a lot, even, even with cases that I've done with you, going back and look at these. I mean, it's just, it's amazing to, to think about these cases and what we can do. And it's a real privilege, Richard, that thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, thank you again to uh, CBI and our sponsors for supporting this. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all again really soon. Uh, thank you.